Welcome, welcome everybody. Greg Peterson coming to you from Urban Farm U. And I am here with Miss Janice. Hello, Janice. Hello again, Greg. I'm calling in actually tonight from Southern California. I'm here helping my sister. So I'm on a different computer, but I'm still able to help in the background here. Nice. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, tonight we have a really, really, really important topic to discuss. I have been saying for years, the most important thing we can be doing right now is figuring out where our food comes from and how to grow our own. And that's kind of what we're talking about tonight, isn't it, David? It sure is. Yeah. yeah. Right. So David is primarily a botanist. He received his BS in biology from North Carolina State University and an MS and PhD in botany from the University of Wisconsin. He then served as a research scientist at the USDA Forest Experiment Station in Rhinelander, Wisconsin, and was a Humboldt Fellow at University of Göttingen, Germany. Prior to joining the faculty of Maharishi International University, he was a professor and researcher at the University of Hawaii. Since leaving MIU, he now devotes his time to sustainability, research, and writing. Welcome to the show tonight, David. Glad to be here. It's going to be fun. Yes, yes. Thank you. Can you give us a 15-second synopsis of what we're talking about tonight? All right. I'm going to compare the efficiency of home food gardens with the industrial food system and show you why home gardens can feed a hundred times as many people as the industrial food system per acre. That's what I love. I have been saying for years that the, with a capital T solution to our global food challenge is growing food in our front and backyard. That's right. So I love it. And you have a book, it's called Just Grow It Yourself. I have a copy of it here. Um, and we'll talk about that toward the end of your presentation. So are you ready to go? Yes. Welcome, everybody. Tonight, I am going to make the case for a home garden anchored food system. And what I'm going to be doing is comparing the efficiency of home gardens to the industrial system. And the two basic measures I'm going to use are yield and external costs. So here we go. Now, you may remember back in 2004, Morgan Spurlock did a documentary in which he ate only at McDonald's for 30 days. And he got a medical exam before and after. And he documented, of course, what happened to his body. And so in 2002, I was, I mean, 2020, I was thinking about that and I had a garden. And I was thinking, well, I wonder what would happen if I did the same kind of thing, but instead of eating only from McDonald's for 30 days, I ate only food from my garden. I had been gardening for some time. So I had a garden that was big enough to, I thought, accommodate me. And I did that, even though I wasn't a vegetarian. For that month, I had to be a vegetarian. I was able to eat only from my garden for 30 days. In the process of doing that, well, first of all, I got a medical exam before and after. And in the process of doing it, I kept a very careful record of everything I ate, the weight right down to the 10th of an ounce, and exactly how much room in my garden it took to grow it, that is in square feet. And I was able to do it, all right? So then I thought, well, if I can do it for 30 days, could I do it for a year? How much? space, how large of a garden would it take to do that? So I did the math and so forth. And I found that it would should be a garden of 35 by 40 feet that should feed me for a year at the rate at which I ate food from my own garden in 2020. So here is a illustration of that, a picture of that garden. It's 35 by 40 feet. And of course, we're not going to go all over over all these numbers here, but it's just to show you I had about 20 or so different categories of food. This little garden of 35 by 40 feet produced over a thousand pounds of food. Kind of amazing. And it also produced more than enough servings, that is three servings per meal 
three times a day, 365 days per year. So I thought, well, that's quite good. But then I looked at it in a little bit more detail and I discovered that I didn't have enough protein and enough calories really for my basic metabolic rate. You know, my taking into consideration my weight, my height, my frame and all of that. So I thought, well, could I still grow if I rearranged my garden? Could I still live on it for a year at the growth rates, the yield rates that I got in this garden? And I found that I could. What I had to do was have a little bit more of the high calorie, high protein crops, especially corn for dried corn and dried beans and a few other things that were really heavy yielders, but at the same growth rates that I used in 2020. And I found that I could do it. Okay. Enough servings, enough calories, enough protein. Now, full disclosure, probably most of you know that there's no vegetable that will produce vitamin B12. So in order to get a vitamin B12, I'd have to have maybe a couple of egg laying hens on the side, and that would help a little bit with the protein too. But still, I could do it. 35 by 40 feet for a year. Now, here's the most interesting thing in the whole presentation. It takes over three acres, actually 3.2 acres to feed an American for a year with the industrial food system. Okay. That is basically a hundred times what it takes me. So here's my little square up here. This is to um, scale. So this little square up here is one hundredth of this here. This is my garden and this represents the industrial food system. I can feed myself for a year on 35 by 40 feet. It takes 3.2 acres. I round it off to three just for convenience sake. This is astounding. So this is what I'm going to kind of enlarge on. And I'm first going to sort of put it in different ways because most people, when I tell them this, they just can't believe it. So I'm gonna give you a little bit more chance to sort of digest it. So here it is, three acres of gardens like mine will feed a hundred people. Three acres of the industrial food system feeds just one person. I'll put it one more way. Three acres of home gardens feeds 100 people. Here's about 100 people, just representational. Three acres of the industrial food system feeds one person. Most people say, are you kidding me? How could this possibly be? Everybody knows that a farmer on a tractor can do the job of 100 gardeners with shovels and hoes, right? And what about the great Supermarkets with 42,000 items delivered in just in time every day. Super fantastic efficiency, isn't it? Actually, no, it isn't. And that's what I'm going to explain to you. The easiest way to see it is to consider the system as a whole and how food flows through the system. So this was produced by the University of Michigan, a food flow chart. And if you start on the far left side here, there are two main components of the system that you start out with, crop production, and then the feed to, for livestock and poultry. And these two kind of get mixed up in the middle, right? They're, they're combined a little bit. Okay? So we start out, if it's converted to pounds, 1.89 trillion pounds of food biomass to start with. Okay? And then this food biomass on a national scale it moves through the system and certain things start dropping out. Respiration, animal waste, live animals, exports, industrial uses, long-term storage, more exports, processing and water losses, more processing and water losses, retail losses, food consumer, food service and consumer losses. Until finally you get to this figure here, what actually makes it to the fork of the consumer. So converted again to trillion pounds, we go from 1.89 to 
0 0.2%, 0 0.26 trillion pounds. Only 14% of the food that we started with actually is consumed. 86% drops out between field and fork. Okay. So if you kind of start to digest that a little bit, you can see how we lose so much. And now it's not really completely lost. Some of it is lost. Exports, of course, on a cash basis, there's only about 5% more exports than there are imports currently. And these other things, industrial uses, they're not really lost. They go and they serve other purposes like fuel for cars and things like that. This is the system as it repre is represented by the industrial model. So look how much simpler it is with a garden. From planted to consumed, it's much, much closer. So what this system, home gardens do is they eliminate exports, imports, industrial uses, most waste, water, respiration and processing losses, and long-term storage. So when you look at it that way, you see a lot less loss between what's produced and what's consumed. And if you go back, we'll go back this one again. Even when you get to the items that are consumed, most of these are not produced in gardens. Okay. So you make a few other um, accommodations like that, and you do get pretty close to about a 99% difference between home gardens and the industrial food system. Now, people have reactions to this. So they say, oh, David, you must be out there, you know, working like a slave, you know, 10 hours a day in order to produce a thousand pounds of vegetables on 35 by 40 feet. No, about an hour a day. I only have six hours of direct sunshine on my garden. It's got a big tree on one side and the apartment building on the other side. The soil is not all that great. It's heavy clay. I used in my 2021 garden, only hand tools. My rows are pretty far apart, three and a half feet, and still produced over a thousand pounds of food. Oh, and by the way, I was at the perfect age of 72 at that time, 2021. So it's not like I'm some super gardener that you know is just doing amazing things. And you can see that down at the bottom here with this little table. So we have yield over here in pounds per square foot. Now, in the study that was published in 2018 in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences that compared vegetable production and commercial and also garden. And what they found was that the garden average was about twice that of commercial. Now this is in field yield rates. This isn't considering the system as a whole, just right at the beginning, in field yield rates. My garden came in at a little bit better than the average commercial. But if you look at the absolute optimal that you can get, this is from an outfit called Urban Homestead in California, 1.6. So you see that my rate is not particularly impressive compared to this. In fact, it's only a little bit more, a little bit higher than the average garden yield rate. So the point I'm making here is, <clears throat> if I can do this, anybody can do it. If I can do it at 72, the average age in this country is 38. Just about anybody should be able to do it. And I'm only getting very modest rates of production. At this rate of production, 100 gardens the size of mine would feed not 100 people, but 230 people. So my results are kind of conservative and modest. I'm not a super gardener. Of course, the next thing that people say is, oh, well, sure, but you know, what Americans eat are not just vegetables out of the garden. And they're right. 85% of the American diet is processed foods. And you see an, um, sort of an illustration of those here. <clears throat> junk food, some things are not so junk food, TV dinners, 
sugar, lots of sugar, lots of processed grains, processed meats, processed dairy. This is what Americans eat. So yes, a garden doesn't produce most of that, but then why would we want to produce, continue producing that? In view of the fact that there are about 570,000 diet-related deaths in our country every year. That's more on a yearly basis than COVID or high blood pressure or cigarettes. Okay? We also know that we use about 70% of us are overweight, 40% uh, obese, over a third of us have diabetes or prediabetes. So this diet is what produces that. So we don't wanna duplicate this with gardens. We want to have uh, a diet that's well-balanced, nutritious, that doesn't produce all those results. Okay, there are other ways that the industrial food system, that's what this stands for, IFS, stands for. Energy consumption. Of the food you eat, it takes eight times as much energy to produce it as there is energy in the food itself. So energy-wise, it's also not very efficient. Same thing with water, material, and time. All right, so is the industrial food system then as efficient as we all hear that it is? Well, not when you really look at the numbers. Again, the ratio of food initially produced, that food flow chart, to that that's actually consumed is seven to one. Probably most of you have heard that the average distance from the farm or field to fork is 1,500 miles. Changes hands at least eight to 10 times. The ratio of production energy to food energy, as you just saw, eight to one. In spite of all of the supposed um, efficiency, we still have 18% of our population that's food insecure. In spite of the cost of food stamps and so forth, other food aid money from the government, $120 billion a year. So it's not looking so good for industrial food efficiency. All right, so what I'm gonna do now is turn to the other way of looking at it, which is external costs. And that comes to about two to $3 trillion a year. Now, for those of you who may not be familiar with external costs or externalities, these are costs that are incurred by the food system, but which it doesn't pay for. So for instance, pollution and all of the, we'll look at this second one here, pollution and all of the different ways it costs other segments of society to deal with it. The farmers don't pay it, the grocers don't pay it, certainly the big food companies in the middle don't pay it. Since I'm here in Iowa, I like to give the example of the nitrate removal system in the waterworks treatment plant in Des Moines, the capital of our state. This is kind of what it looks like on the inside. It has to remove nitrogen fertilizer, which runs off from the agricultural fields into the Des Moines and Fox rivers. And the city of, of Des Moines has to rely on the Des Moines River for a good percentage of its water. So it has to remove that nitrate. The nitrate removal facility in Des Moines is the largest in the world. It cost millions to build it, it cost millions to maintain it, and it's recently cost millions to upgrade it. Who pays that? Not the food industry, not the farmers, not the grocers, not the big middlemen, taxpayers. And there are a number of other ways that other segments of society pay for these costs, these external collateral damage that the food industry itself doesn't pay for. You may have heard of the dead zone around the base of the Mississippi. That fertilizer from the Midwest goes down the Mississippi and it ruins the fishing industry right around New Orleans and so forth. And there are many such places that like that around the world. Obesity, you know, overweight. Um, erosion, soil erosion. And then all the food workers all along the way, they're usually, taken advantage of, especially in places like meat processing plants and migrant farm workers in the field. How would you like to be doing this eight hours a day? All right, those are external costs. 
How much? Well, in recent years, there have been a number of true cost mega studies. And we're not going to go over all of these, but if you just look at the figures in red, these are very large uh, studies done by big organizations. 12 trillions, 224% of 1 trillion in revenues, 3 trillion, 3.2 trillion, 5 trillion, 2.6 trillion, 1.7 trillion just for the cost of obesity, diabetes, and prediabetes. So these are all costs that the food industry incurs, but it doesn't pay. As a result, with all the steps going through the whole food system, all of these costs are incurred, but at the checkout counter, you pay only about one third of the true cost. What a deal. Of course, we do pay in other ways. It's just at the checkout counter, we don't. So we get cheap, efficient, artificially cheap, but convenient food. So putting this all together, per pound of food consumed, acre of land utilized, quad of energy applied, ton of material used, dollar spent, home gardens can feed at least 100 times as many people as the industrial food system. In the process, it generates far superior health, social, economic, environmental, national security, and spiritual benefits. What are these? Here's a chart that sort of gives you some idea. We are not going to go over and discuss each one of these, but these again are the three of the six different categories. Health benefits, economic benefits, social, environmental, even spiritual. Especially important nowadays is national security with all the catastrophes caused by global climate change. So I am well aware that people are not going to rush right out, everybody, and start a food garden. Although about 41% of all households already have one. So what I do propose is that we start up a new, what I call three-tiered garden food system. It would be anchored by home and community gardens. That is, that would be the most important component. But it would be backed up by our local food streams, you know, farmers markets, CSAs, food hubs, uh, urban farms, all of those more local, I mean, truly local, um, smaller, more sustainable farms. And they in turn would be backed up by uh, or complemented by a sustainably reconfigured uh, sort system of distant food sources. We're not going to get rid of industrial right away. And I wouldn't even want to. Okay? There's a lot of good things it does. And so let's take a look at what it looks like. Right now, food systems are in this country almost entirely industrial. Local farms and so forth, community food systems are about 1%, that is, produce about 1% of our food. We don't know how much home gardens produce because the USDA, USDA doesn't track it. Neither does industry. Neither do the large gardening organizations. I've been trying to get them to do it for a couple of years now, and they're just not interested. It's almost entirely industrial right now. What will it look like in 2042? Maybe a third each? Who knows? How about in 40 years? 2062? Who knows? One thing is certain, though. Industrial is far too dysfunctional to maintain itself. It has to change. Erosion is occurring at such a rate that if it doesn't, if we don't get that under control, really under control, we won't have any topsoil left, and then the whole thing crashes virtually overnight. That cannot happen. We can't allow that to happen. That's just one example of the way that the food system is dysfunctional and unsustainable. So can gardens scale up? Everybody thinks of gardens as these pitiful little things where somebody just raises a few tomato plants, a little bit of kale in their backyard, but it's sort of pitiful, right? Well, here's the thing that most people don't know. Russia is not exactly on everybody's favorite list now, but in Russia, 
40, 50%, 40 to 50% of their total food output comes from home gardens, household gardens. Furthermore, on just 3% of its agricultural land. They have been doing this for centuries. They did it before the czars. They did it through the czars. They did it through the Bolsheviks. They did it through the Soviets. And now they're doing it through Putin times. Okay. They are just fabulous home gardeners, and they will continue no matter what happens with their government. Russia is a country of about 146 million people. So, so 73 million people, in essence, live on home gardens. It is scalable. It's the best example I know of. But there are others around the world. In Nigeria, the gardeners there produce 50% of their country's vegetables on just 2% of its agricultural land. Notice how these tiny, these tiny amounts of land on these countries are similar to what I was claiming with my 100 to 1 ratio of home gardens to the industrial food system. And even in our own country, we produce 40% of our vegetables on 20 million home gardens. That was the country was 138 million at that time in the last stages of World War II. So yes, home gardens can scale up to mass production. And in fact, they can do it pretty quickly as we found with the Victory Gardens, not only in the US, but in other countries. And it's already happening. As I mentioned, 41% of all households now have a food garden of some kind. Another survey found that 67% of all adults in this country either already have a home food garden or are thinking about starting one. The last couple of years, the sales of seed, gardening, and preserving flies, supplies have just gone through the roof. And I've done the calculations. We have enough lawn space that if it was converted, if it was converted to home gardens, could feed 90% of the population. What about the other 10%? There are people that live in very high density places, that is more than 10,000 people per square mile. You are not going to have home gardens there, just not possible. But the other 90% of the population, it is possible. So I'm going to end now with coming back to this statement. Per acre, home gardens can feed at least 100 times, that is at least 100 times as many people as the industrial food system. I have written the book, which we're gonna talk about a little bit. And I do have a website which updates and expands on the book quite a bit. It's just growityourself.com. Okay, so I believe Greg has some questions now. Oh, yes. Yes, yes, absolutely. All right. And if you'd unshare your screen. Stop share. Yeah, that would be good. All right. Wow. I'll tell you what, there has been a lot of chatter in the, um, in the, in the chat room. People are, people are talking about it. So good job. Did you uh, turn off your uh, camera? David? That was me by mistake. I accidentally did that to him. David, you need to start your video again. Okay, do it. All right, there we go. All right. Excellent. Um, Nina wants to know, can you ask David if he should share his garden plan with us? <clears throat> or if he would, uh, what he grows and where he puts it in a 30 to 40 garden. Is it in this book, in your book? It's not in the book, but it is on my website. Okay. Oh, there you go. Go to the blog and um, what's your website? Back in the blogs of justgrowityourself.com. It describes exactly the complete layout of my 2021 garden, how much I planted of everything. And then in a late and a, a little bit later blog, the exact results of everything that I produced. And not nice. only that, but the one after that, which is if I rearranged it so that I have more energy and calorie producing crops, but grown at the same rate as the 2021 garden. So it's all there in blogs. Just, just go back to them, you'll find them. Ah, this is a great, thank you for that. This is a great question from Nina living in Iowa. How did he continue to grow his garden in the winter 
or did he preserve, et cetera, the food from the garden to live for 365 days? Of course, we have to produce. Gardens do not grow in Iowa in the wintertime, at least not outside. Mm -hmm. Yes, there's the staples. That is, there's first of all dry production. You just store it in containers. Dried mm -hmm. beans, dried corn. I make a lot mm -hmm. of grits from my dried corn. But also I canned a lot. I froze a lot and pickled things. And you can even dry things. And uh, I didn't do this, but you can dehydrate, slice things slow, you know, juicy things up and dry and dry them in dehydrators. Yeah. Food preservation is an absolute necessity unless you live in the tropics or semi-tropics where you can just grow things and eat straight out of the garden all year. This is necessary. Food yeah. preservation. Yeah, well, and there's, you know, Kari Spencer talks a lot about that, and especially in our Growing Food, the Basics course. Mm -hmm. And um, it's a lot simpler than you might think. I actually planted my first peach tree in 1974. And by 1979, I had so many peaches, I didn't know what to do with them all. And I said to one of my friends back then, I was 19 years old. I said, man, I wish I knew how to can this stuff. He said, my mom will teach you. And so I went to his mom's house with, uh, I went to my friend's house with a bunch of peaches. And within a couple hours, we had canned peaches. Right. It's simple. It's not difficult. None yeah. of this is rocket science. It's all highly doable. After what 20 million gardeners in World War II can start it up in just like two years. It is not like becoming a physicist. Right. Yeah. Well, and, you know, with with the challenges, I love what you wrote. Industri the industrial food system is far too dysfunctional. And in many ways, broken. That's right and breaking down more and more. And That's right. you know, I, I'm thinking, you know, in the next 10 to 20 years, we could see empty grocery shelves as, you know, a standard in the grocery stores. It's gonna be very interesting to see how things unfold. Yeah, it is. What I'm it? promoting is doing an end run around the industrial system by really ramping up home garden food production. Yep. That's the way to go. Yeah, amen to that. Uh, Rosanna wants to know, can you share more about the number and types of crops that you grew? Well, it's in the blogs. It's all the information is right there. It's all laid mm -hmm. out in tables and so forth in the blogs and just go at yourself.com. Can you, can, you mean right are, now? Yeah. What are the top three, th four, three or four things that you grew? Well, it depends on how you measure it in terms of weight. Uh -huh. The things that are juicy, like tomatoes, oh, are yeah. very high on the list. But in terms of calories, the top things are corn, not for sweet corn, but for dried, making into grits and cornmeal, ah. and dried beans. Those two per pound provide about 1,600 calories per pound. Uh, sweet potatoes are come in at about 500 calories per pound. So I grow a lot of corn, beans, and sweet potatoes. Believe it or not, kale has more calories per pound than a lot of winter squashes like butternuts and so forth. That's a real surprise, but it does. But who's going to eat that much kale? Okay. Uh -huh. so anyway, um, oh, just regular potatoes. That's not nearly as high as sweet potatoes in terms of calories. Yep. And it goes down the list. I have a list of that also just write down the list of the things that you can grow to actually outfit yourself in terms of not only vitamins and minerals but also protein and calories for a year amen and tess says uh kale chips are fantastic yes they are and my sweetie heidi makes a uh kale salad to absolutely live for. And I'll give you the recipe real quick. It's super simple. You uh, cut up the kale very uh, thinly um, and add cranberries and walnuts and olive oil and balsamic vinegar. And it's just, oh my gosh, to absolutely live for. Really sounds good. Yeah. Stephanie wants to know what was the result of your health exam after eating from your garden oh. for a month? Okay. I'll just give you two highlights. 
I did lose three pounds. However, I've gained nice. and lost much more than that in my life. Right. 15, 20 pounds in either direction. So that's sort of insignificant. The other interesting thing was um, I had just a slightly high cholesterol rate. And in 30 days, it dropped 15 points. There you the go. First who did the final exam was just amazed. Yep. 15 points in 30 days. Yep. Amen to that too. Um, Derek wants to know from Winnipeg, uh, Canada, does David have a preferred way to purchase his book that either provides a greater benefit to him or benefits to a charity or similar? Right now, you can go on the website and purchase it there through uh, Amazon.com. If you were here in Fairfield, I would sell it to you for about half that directly because I have a stack of them. Uh, um, but uh, I have not set up anything for charity. No, I haven't done that. It's a good idea. I just haven't thought of a, it yet. Yep, yeah, that's a good idea. Absolutely. Um, Amy wants to know, are you still eating eggs? If so, do you grow food for your chickens? I have not. I, I live actually on the campus of the university here, and they don't like people to have hens in their yards. Nice. <laughs> Maybe somebody will challenge that at some point. So I do not have hens, but a lot of people around here do. You can get fresh eggs at the farmer's market all the time. Yeah. Uh, I would do that if I didn't live on campus. A lot of my friends do that. And it is legal here in Fairfield. There's even a website that tells all about it. It's called cluck.com. Cluck.com. Oh, I got to love it. Got to love it. Nina wants to know, living in Iowa... Oh, no, I already answered that question. Diana wants to know, what do you use to feed your plants and soil so your garden produces maximum veggies or, uh, or they don't die from pests? Also, how do you avoid from uh, being eaten alive by chiggers? <laughs> mm -hmm. um, here in Iowa, out in the woods and fields, I have gotten as many as 170 chigger bites at one time. Oh, but I grew up in the fields and woods in North Carolina and the mountains and, you know, stings, bites of every kind. They just don't bother me. Um, so what was the first part of the question again? Oh, my gosh. Um, how do you fertilize your plants oh, and soil? Compost. Okay. We have a really a couple of really good um, sources of compost. I can get a, a ton of it delivered. That's about what? A few cubic yards. Mm -hmm. We use a lot of that because the soil, as I mentioned, is heavy clay soil. It's not very good at all. Mm -hmm. Very difficult to deal with. So I add compost. And in the book, I talk about how what I do for corn. You know, corn likes a lot of nitrogen. About, ooh, it must have been 20 years ago, Anna Eady, who is a big greenhouse enthusiast, came and gave a talk here. And she talked about how she used a 10% solution of her own urine on the plants around her house. Okay. Interesting. Just 10%. So I remembered that. So I thought, okay, I'm going to do that for the corn to give it some extra nitrogen. And oh I, my gosh, yes. And in the book, I describe how that's still a lot less, because I kept very, very good records on just how much I supplied. Mm -hmm. Still a lot less nitrogen than the nitrogen, chemical nitrogen fertilizer that goes on the cornfields around here, of which there are millions of acres. Yep. And still, the next year, my 2021 garden, I got a yield rate that was greater than the national average for corn in terms of bushels per acre. I didn't have an acre's worth, but converted to bushels per acre. Yeah. Right. Well, and a big part of that is the chemical fertilizers that they use that are so high in nitrogen kill the soil biology. That's right. And stunt the stunt the plants. That's right. Yeah. Well, they do get they do get an awful lot of corn. I mean, when you just go out and look at those cornfields, it kind of looks impressive. But a lot of the fertilizer, as I mentioned, goes down to the water table, goes through those tiles, gets into the rivers goes down the mississippi and mm -hmm. on and on and on it goes yeah uh dr rick says where specifically on your website blog is your garden plan um go back i don't remember the actual name of it i'd have to look it up but um 
uh, I believe it's called the results are in. Okay, that's the actual results. Go one or two blocks back from that and you will see the garden plan. Perfect. I don't, I just don't remember the name of it right now. It's been a good cool. little while. But just go back a couple of blocks from that and you'll see the actual plan. Perfect. Uh, Rosanna says, can you give us a YouTube link for the playback? Yes, that'll be coming out to you tomorrow. Um, Derek says, what consideration would be, would there be for a garden size in different parts of the world, USD zone, frost-free dates, heat units? I think 35 by 40 garden would need to be altered in different places. Uh, he's right. Okay. If you're in the arid Southwest, it's going to probably have to be a little larger. It mm -hmm. depends really, it depends more than that. When it's, you're talking about a dry place, it depends on how much water you can get. Right. And boy, we know what that's like in the Southwest right now. Other places, it will just vary so much depending on what you eat. Remember, my results were less, only a little bit more than half of the average in terms of yield. And 40% of that permaculture garden out in California. So it depends on a lot of things. But yes, it will vary. You know, depending yeah. on what you grow, where you grow it, how you grow it, how many people you're trying to feed and all those things. Mo, thank you, Mo. He, uh, he put out the uh, Just Grow It Yourself link for your garden project. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, Denise says, my first year for planting a fall garden in my backyard, any tips? Uh, Denise lives in Northwest Arkansas. Um, I'm, let me jump in here real quick. Okay. Get a get a planting calendar for your area. Mm -hmm. That'll tell you what to plant when. That'll help a lot. What do you think? Uh, depends on what you want to do, and it depends on how you go about it. My number one recommendation is whatever you do, do it in a way that you enjoy it. Mm. Enjoyment has to run the whole thing or else you won't stick with it. Yes. And then think about the foods that you like and think about it in terms of, well, do you want to just have a few things to augment your regular diet or do you want to get a little more serious? Mm -hmm. How many people I would like to know if I could see a show of hands, how many people listening to this have ever had one full meal of things that they grew only in their garden. Oh my gosh. I have. All yeah. right. That's what I did first. And then yeah. I said, okay, well, if I can do it for one meal, I'll see if I can do it for a day. And I did it for a day. And then yeah. that's how I went on up to, you know, a month and then calculated that I could also do it for a year. So you gradually increase and you make sure you enjoy every single step and make sure you get enough protein and enough calories so that you're not just eating tomatoes and cucumbers. On the right. other hand, for people- Hold on, hold on one sec, hold that, hold that thought. So uh, Mo has, Tess has, Milani has, Mindy has, uh, Deb says not yet, but will later this summer. Um, so yeah. Great, fantastic. People have. If you've uh, you done know, it for one meal, try it for a day. Yeah. So anyway, just to complete the thought. Yes, please. Uh, there is a case where you don't really need to worry about calories and protein so much. And that is if you're trying to lose weight, if you're trying to really seriously lose weight. So is that how I get my, my, my beer you don't gut? Have to worry. We're <laughs> talking about people that have a much bigger uh, challenge. There is a video called Fat, Sick, and Almost Dead. Yep. You should look that up. And it's all about somebody who is really, really seriously overweight and how he brought his weight down, eating mostly those watery vegetables. For him, yeah. it was appropriate, but it wouldn't be appropriate for everyone. Yeah. So I just want to say, if you're a fairly normal weight, yes, be sure you have plenty of protein and carbohydrates and calories. But if you're really seriously trying to lose weight, just eat lots of kale, tomatoes, mm. cucumbers, and all the greens and all of those good things. You lose yeah. weight and you'll get a lot healthier in the process. Tess says the number one means to lose weight in a healthy manner is simply dropping sugar from your diet. And then she put, she spelled out the word period in all caps. Okay. Amen to that. Fine. 
Yeah. Amen Anything to that. that helps. Yeah. All right. Let's see here. Um, Nina wants to know, how do you keep sweet potatoes from sprouting? Uh, very good question. I've now grown sweet potatoes for two years in a row. The first year, I just took them out, put them in a dry storage area. Mm -hmm. And then I assume that most people that grow sweet potatoes know you have to cure them before you eat them. That oh, is, I don't know that. What's that about? What you do is you have to keep them at about 85 degrees day and night for at least one week. When they come right out of the ground, you don't just eat them like potato. I mean, you can, but they don't taste like much. You know, they're ah. So you put them in a little habitat somehow in a box or whatever you can figure out uh, for one week at about 80 to 85 degrees. And then the starches get transformed uh, into sugars. And that's what makes them sweet potatoes. Okay? Ah. So the first year I did that in just little batches of about a week or so. Yeah. And kept the rest of them on the shelf and they mostly didn't sprout until the following year. This year, I decided to do all the curing at once. And I did in the fall. And oh my goodness, it wasn't long before they were sprouting and I had to keep pulling the sprouts off and pulling the sprouts, oh, off, pulling the sprouts off. So I decided for my sweet potato crop this year, I'm gonna do some more research and maybe I'll go back to just leaving them you know, untreated until I need a, a bunch, you know, a week's worth or so and treat those. And then the next time I need some more, I'll treat those and so forth. And that worked the first year just by accident. Yeah. Uh, but I'm going to do some more research on that and just sort of find out more about it. But cool. you do have to cure sweet potatoes if you really want sweet, sweet potatoes instead of flat tasting ones. Perfect. Uh, Joan wants to know who is your seed source? And I have an answer for this for me, but go ahead. Many. <laughs> right uh i my favorite one is um let's see what is it called baker creek well uh, i do get some from baker creek but that's not my number one i'm looking at the i have so many i get some from different ones um now i can't territorial seed that's the one i like the best oh yes territorial, territorial seed company that's the one yep. that i like the best of course i do save some seeds too and sometimes oh. I get uh, seeds from, you know, neighbors. My next door neighbors gave me some plants that I grew last year for what's called Indian zucchinis. They're called Loki. Uh -huh. Those things grow like Jack and the Beanstalk. You know? Nice. And I saved some seeds last year and started my own plants this year. And they're producing, oh my goodness, four, six pound yeah. zucchinis that are fabulous. Yes. We're, we're big, 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 big seed savers here. By the way, Greg, did you know that the state vegetable for North Carolina is the sweet potato? I did know that. Okay. And, and I also know that uh, North Carolina raises a lot. There's number four or fifth of sweet potatoes growers in the country. I didn't know that. Yeah, really high on the list of uh, production. That's one of our big food productions here. Yeah. Um, let's see here. So we got five or six questions left. Uh, we're going to wrap with these. Um, let's see here. Stephanie wants to know, do you utilize greenhouses, hoop houses, et cetera, to grow your garden? Are these forms of season extenders necessary? I guess it depends where you live. Well, if you live in almost anywhere in the United States where it gets down below freezing in the winter, mm -hmm. then and you want to grow things like tomatoes, peppers, and a number of other things, you do have to hit starts. So here in the Fairfield, we do have a farmer's market where people who have greenhouses do produce a number of those starts. But this year, I made my own little greenhouse, which was a box that I just projected out of my window on the south side of the apartment. There you go. And I used that, and it worked. Okay, It worked just fine. Not everybody's going to be able to do that. I am fortunate to have some engineering skills, uh, but that's not going to be available for everybody. So yes, greenhouses, greenhouse starts are sort of a must if you're going to grow those things that you need to start indoors first. Yeah. Um, quickly, do you have to cure white potatoes? Do you know no. about potatoes? No, 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 you don't have to. Okay, good. I didn't think so. Um, 
Tess wants to know if we're to make a the transition to yard gardens, the next evolution would be seed saving. Yes, absolutely, without a doubt. Mm -hmm. And um, check out greatamericanseedup.org. It's a company that I run with Bill McDormand, Bell Star, Kari Spencer, and uh, Janice Norton. And it, it's all about super energizing our local seed economies. Mm -hmm. um, let's see here. Rosanna says, for your garden, you mentioned it wasn't the best soil and you only have six hours of sun. Did you add fertilizer or compost to the plants? Okay, so we already talked about that. Yeah. Compost and more compost. Um, I'm assuming you probably preserved some of the food because you couldn't have a year round garden. And we kind of right. touched on that as well. Right. right. What did you, what was your favorite thing that you preserved? Um, you know, what turned out to be the most pleasant surprise was pickled green tomatoes. I got a recipe that makes them absolutely delicious. And when I gave wow. them away, people would just eat them like candy. So I got, to where I was having pickled green tomatoes every morning for breakfast with my grits and with some little bean patties that I made from my beans instead of sausage. Mm -hmm. So those three together just made a fabulous breakfast. Nice. And um, okay, it was there and it's gone. Let's see here. Tim says, farming seems to be rapidly shifting to intensive indoor production following the cannabis experience. How does that compare on efficiency environmental impacts to traditional industrial tractor farming and to home ultra small scale organic production? Okay, I have seen, I can't tell you how many articles that extol internal, that is inside food production. But here's mm -hmm. the thing that almost all the articles don't mention. You can do that, but you can't do it for high energy foods like yeah. corn, dried beans, sweet potatoes, um, anything that is energy dense does not get enough light. I don't care how many rows, how many banks of, you know, super bright lights you put, you cannot grow that stuff. You can grow lots of lettuce, even tomatoes, cucumbers, even zucchinis, mm -hmm. things that have a lot of water in them, but not very yeah. many calories per unit of weight. You cannot live long on that unless you're way overweight and just live off of your excess fat for a while. Yeah. Yeah. You cannot do that. So yes, they're great, sure. do it, but you can't, you can't live on just water. Yeah. Jewel says, can I repost on Facebook one of the more dramatic pictures with numbers from your presentation? I'll have to talk with my uh, webmaster about how to do things like that, but well, you she, can- She you took can, a screenshot. I'm sure, and wants to post it on Facebook as long as she links to your as website. As, as long as she attributed it, attribute it uh, to my website, yeah, I yep. have no problem. Excellent. Um, Mary Ann says, I have heard, read or heard that you should wrap each sweet potato in newspaper and then harvest before the frost. Yeah, good question. I've never heard of that one. Yeah, nor have I. All right, that's a wrap. Um, let's talk about a couple things. Tell us about your book and where people can find it. Okay, just go to my website, justgrowityourself.com. You can order it there. Um, this is a book that I wrote uh, when I was thinking that I would just urge everybody to start um, Victory Gardens. And then when I started doing the research, and actually comparing home gardens with the industrial food system, that's when I found out how much vastly more efficient they are. Mm -hmm. So that was the book that I wrote before I did the 2021 garden. So it does describe my results of the 30 day experiment, okay? the 30 day eating experiment. That's why I say, if you really want to get a much fuller, much more updated version of what the book talks about, go to the blogs and just go through them in order and you'll see what happened since then. I just posted four new blogs as of about yesterday. Nice. So it's all there. Nice, nice, nice. Well, thank you so much for your time tonight uh, and for your You're presentation. Welcome. It was a pleasure. There was well over a hundred people 
here tonight, which is a good turnout. We will be uh, posting this on YouTube uh, as of probably tomorrow. And so uh, people, and we'll be sending it out to our entire list for the replay. So um, Teresa says, thank you. Jewel says, thank you. Donna says, this was awesome. Um, uh, one more thing, if uh, we do a lot of these events uh, and we do them to educate people and uh, we ask for donations. Uh, and so if you go to urbanfarm.org forward slash donate, you can check out the different options for donating to support the work that we're doing here in the world and, and keep the lights on and keep paying for the website. So urbanfarm.org forward slash donate. Um, I think there, let me, uh, I can put that in, there we go. There it is. It's a little longer than that, but if you go to urbanfarm.org forward slash donate, it'll be there for you. Okay. Once again, David, thank you so very much. When I uh, end this, we're going to disappear, so we'll have to chat another time. Anything okay. else, Miss Janice? No, we are really good. All right. David, thank you, everybody. It's been great. Thank you. Yes, yes, yes. Thanks for inviting me. I really appreciate uh, that. You bet. Oh my gosh, this is uh, this was everything and I hoped it would be. Yes, Janice. And we do have the podcast as well with David Fisher that was released earlier. Um, yep. I did put the link in there, but if you go to urbanfarm.org podcast, you can start seeing all of our podcasts, including David's. Perfect. Awesome. Thank you, everybody. Have a good one. Thank you, David. Bye, Bye now.